messages I've preached in many, many years. You need to get 70s served. If you care about your children and you and you're really care about the next generation, which is your kids, you want to find out how, how do I get them on track to live for God and st stay focused and one of the statements I made in that sermon, which is true today, if when you go to be with the Lord, look at me, and you're more successful than your children, you haven't succeeded at all. And there are many of you that are wondering, where am I going to get money for college? Where am I going to get money for their this and, and, and their that, their wedding and, and, and this? Get that sermon. I'm going to tell you something. It'll challenge you. It'll challenge you. One of the major topics there is that every deed, every deed has a seed. Everything you do, good or bad, everything you do plants a seed for the next generation, which is your kids. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Can we go? Let's, let's, let's just settle down here just for a minute. Concentrate on what I'm telling you because this is of utmost importance. There's an old Chinese proverb that I've taught you over and over and over again. And the Chinese proverb says this one generation plants the seed. You older folks look at one another and say, That's us. And the next generation turn to somebody and say, That's our children. The next generation enjoys the shade. Amen. One generation, us, plants the seed. The next generation enjoys the shade. That's our children. And it goes on to say, if the next generation has no shade, the prior generation didn't care enough. They didn't care enough to sacrifice. They didn't care enough to do what's right. What is hard for you, when you put that into action, what is hard for you will be easy for your children. Did you get that? If it's hard for you to come to church, but you come to church anyway, it's going to be easy for your children to come to church. If it's hard for you to pray, but you pray anyway, it's going to be easy for your children to pray. If it's hard for you to read your word, but you read your word anyway, it's going to be easy for your children to read the word. If it's hard for you to tie, and you tithe anyway, it's going to be easy for your children to tithe. Well, that one didn't go over very well. You can tell by the response. But you can't have one without the other, folks. It just doesn't work that way. For every blessing God will give you, there will be a prerequisite. There will be something that God will require from you every single Somebody said, well, salvation is free. No, it will cost you your heart. And it will cost you your life. Every blessing will have a prerequisite in that God will require something of you. You cannot keep coming to churches and lift your hands and say, my name is Jimmy, give me, give me, give me, when you're not giving anything to God. Because God said, in the manner in which you respond to me, I will respond to you. I'll be merciful. I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll, I'll be Give mercy to the merciful. Ah, give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Why? Because that, if you give that way to me, then I'll give that way to you. I'll respond to you according to how you respond to me. Amen. Amen. You can't go to the bank and say, I, I want to withdraw $1,000. One lady says, all right, give me your, your, your account number. Account number? Yeah. I don't have an account number. So you mean you don't have an account here, Mr. Gallegos? No, I, 
But you want to withdraw a thousand dollars? Yes. Well, Mr. Gallegos, you can't withdraw if you haven't put in. And we get that. How many of you know that if you walked into a bank and you did that, they'd blast you right out of that bank? Amen? But we try to do that to God all the time. We try to do it. To, we wouldn't do it to the person at the bank, but we try it on God all the time because we think that he's easy in that area and he doesn't care and he's going to do it anyway. Just because you don't hear God say anything doesn't mean it's okay. Okay, let me, let me see what else I can preach on. This one's not going over very well. Good. Um, Good work. Huh? Good. Good work. Yep. This is basic Christianity. And so anyway, you need to get that that that, that CD, and, and I'm sure it'll, it'll be it'll be an, an eye an eye opener for you. Now I've I've I've, uh, I've started to preach on Wednesdays or try to teach on Wednesdays on the basics of Christianity. The, turn to somebody and say, the Sunday school stuff. Sunday school. Sometimes we want to get so heavy and so religious and so that, that we miss the simplicity of God's word. And so today, I'm going to continue that today, but I, uh, today's lesson is going to be, I want to talk to you about testing yourself. So I'm going to ask you to find a way to get a piece of paper and pencil. You have to borrow from somebody. You shouldn't have to. You should always come equipped. Because I, there's three, there's certain things I'm going to ask you to write down today. Because we're going to, we're going to, we're going to take a test together. Amen? Uh, uh, um, don't worry, you'll pass the test. It's an open book test. And, and, and if you don't have a book, book with you, then you'll see the, the answer on the screen. Turn to somebody and say, there's no way you can flood this. Turn to somebody else and look at it and say, I don't hope. <laughs> there's no way you can flood this. Amen? Father, I just thank and I praise you for your presence. I thank and I praise you for your grace and your mercy and your unconditional love in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 13. We'll begin reading in verse 5. Verse 5 says... Examine yourselves. Turn to your neighbor and say, examine yourself. That's what we're going to do today. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Now, let me tell you something about you are in the faith. This is not talking about faith, the faith that you used to believe God. This is basically saying, examine yourself to see if you're really a Christian. I know it's going to be good now. When it, when it talks about being in the faith, it talks, it's talking about being a Christian. Okay? How many of you understand? Yeah. Somebody shout, Pastor, I got this. <laughs> Examine yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Examine yourself as to whether you're a Christian. Test yourselves. Oh, that's what we're going to do tonight. Yeah. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Verse 6, but I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about the test of being in the faith. Somebody say the test. The, test. the scripture we just read is, is, is a, a, an epistle, if you will, that Paul writes to the church in Corinth. And he's writing because the church in Corinth is a mess. There's a lot of stuff going on there, a lot of different ways of thinking they're going in there, and, and, and it's just beginning a mess. They've got a little bit of everything in that church. And if, if you would read the previous chapter, you'll find Paul saying, I'm afraid to come and visit you guys because I'm afraid of what I might find. And then he named some things that he might find. I might find contentions. I might find jealousies. I might find outbursts of, uh, outbursts of wrath. I might find self-ambitions. I might find... Backbiting, I believe it's the 20th verse of, of chapter 12. I might find backbiting, whispering, conceits. I might find all of this stuff. And I don't know if I really want to come and, and, and visit. And folks, what all this is, is this is drama. And Paul's writing to them to challenge them and to say, I wonder how many of you are truly born again. I wonder how many of you are 
truly born again. How many of you really have a relationship with God? And I personally, I believe that's a really, a, a really valid question. As a matter of fact, I believe that everybody who's going to church needs to ask themselves that question. Am I truly born again? Because as quiet as it's kept, everybody that goes to church is not saved. Well, I knew that wouldn't go very well. I'm going to say that again. Everybody that goes to church is not saved. And that's why, that's why it's, I think it's important that we spend a few minutes talking about that. I don't want anybody that goes to Destiny Community to think that just because you're a member at Destiny or that... That means that your name is on heaven's roll. That means that, that, that you've been and that you're arrived. I, I just want to be, I want to be clear on that. I don't want you to think that just because you got baptized here or because you, you had communion here or because you sing in the choir or because you're an usher or a Sunday school teacher, whatever you're doing, I don't want you to think that that qualifies you as automatically being in the faith. That qualifies as automatically being a Christian. Because being in the faith is qualified by much more. Turn to someone and say, now we're going to have to hear, really listen. It's more than the fact that you've joined the church or that you served in a ministry. We want to make sure, here in Destiny Community, we want to make sure that you have, in fact, a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now understand 
that prior to me pastoring the church, I served the church for a long time. My wife and I served my pastor for a long time, but I don't recall one time where anybody ever asked me if I was in the faith. Not one time. It was just assumed because I was baptized and I was serving in the church. I was ushering and I was at church. Every time the doors opened and it was just commonly understood that I was a Christian. And one day through a rude awakening, I realized that even though all, my, all of my religious activities and my involvement in my church, I realized that down deep inside there was something missing and it was during that time that I cried out to God. Listen, the most important thing you can do is to make sure beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are saved. Yeah, that's right. Come on, church. That's the most important thing that you can do. And whatever that takes to happen, then you need to get that. And you need to do whatever you need to do to make that happen, to make sure you're saved. It would be tragic. Oh, God, hear me. It would be tragic. For you to walk around thinking you're saved and then you die and find out that you're not saved. That would be tragic. And it will not be because the pastor at Destiny Community did not challenge you in asking yourself whether you are truly in the faith. You cannot say, well, Pastor Charlie never told me. Pastor Charlie never asked me. You can't say that to God. That's why this message is of, of utmost importance. So what's the test? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. And here we're going to see the threefold test. And if you need help finding 1 John, it's page 107.3 in my Bible. And we want, we want to look at, we want to look at, Verse 5, 6, and 7. Because here's where we'll find the threefold test. Turn your name and say, well, are you ready? ready. How many of you are ready? Wave at me. Ready. How many of you just don't care? Don't wave at me. <laughs> There's one, don't care. Here's verse 5. Here we go. This is the message. Turn your name and say, this is the message. This is the message, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you. Now, here's the message. Here's the message. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is the message that he's talking about. So here we have the first question of this threefold test. Here's the question you have to ask yourself. The first question is, what do you believe? Write that down. The first question of this test is, what do you believe? Do you believe that God is light? And in him there is no darkness at all. Do you believe that? Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that God is the light of the world? Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe he's the light of the world? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin? Do you believe that he died on a cross for our sins? Do you believe that he was raised from the dead and, and is coming again? Hallelujah. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? This is the core of our faith. This is the core of our Christianity. Is that, is that what we really believe? I'm not just talking about that you put confidence and some kind of credibility in the existence of Jesus. No, it's more than just believing that Jesus existed. The devil knows that Jesus existed. The devil knows that Jesus existed. A lot of people know that Jesus existed, but do you believe that he is the light of the world? Test question number one. What do you believe? You don't be surprised. There'll be a lot of people in churches like ours that have no idea what to believe. They'll repeat to you what somebody else has said, but not because they read it in the Bible or they heard it on the radio, they saw a scripture, but they don't really, in their heart, they don't really know what they believe. Are you in the faith? 
it's important to recognize and to realize that Jesus is born of a virgin. Why isn't that important? Because the Muslims believe he was born. The Muslims believe he was born. The Muslims believe he existed and that he was a good prophet. That's how they receive him. That's how they accept, they accept him as a prophet. They do not believe that he was born of a virgin. They don't believe he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. They believe he was born and conceived by a man. And the reason the virgin birth of Jesus is so important is because the fact that he was born a virgin, which means she had never been with a man, she knew no man, and she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost, would give Jesus the qualification by virgin, by virtue of the fact that his blood is not like the rest of our blood to wash our sins away. Come on, church, give the Lord a praise. Are you with me? Are you all the way with me tonight? You've got to believe that he was born of a virgin. You've got to believe that he was crucified on the cross and took the whipping on his body for our sin. What do you believe? Do you believe? Really, really believe. Do you really believe that what he did on the cross is sufficient enough to have your sins washed away? Do you really believe that? I can't hear you, church. I mean, really, truly, do you believe deep down, do you believe that? Well, why, why would I ask that? Well, because there's some of you that believe that you can work your way to heaven. Come on, And I knew it was going to be quiet, but I had no idea it was going to be this quiet. There's many of you here that believe that you can work your way to heaven. And if you think that you can work your way to heaven, what you're saying in essence, listen, what you're saying in essence is that what Jesus did on the cross is not good enough for my sins to be washed away. That's what you're saying. So I've got to work my way into heaven because what he did on the cross is not good enough. My sins are too big. They're bigger than the Jesus that died on that cross. They're bigger than the blood that he shed for me. So I will work myself into heaven. Turn your neighbor and say, this is getting good. <laughs> Folks, I'm not trying to work my way by, into heaven. My worth cannot get me into heaven. My worth, say that, my worth cannot get me into heaven. My works are not good enough to get me into heaven. I can only get to heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross for my sin. Somebody shout hallelujah. I've got to believe that, that he died on the cross for my sins and that he was buried. And the, the burial part, hear me, the burial part is important too because when he went in the grave, he took our sins with him. Amen. He took our sins with him. Amen. Now I know, I know you all, you all sounds like tonight, like I'm probably preaching to the wrong church. It's, it, it sounds like it. I know some of y'all believe that you were born in sin, that you were born sanctified. That you were born filled with the Holy Ghost and your sins weren't that big. But I tell you, I don't know about you, but I can tell you, I messed up big time in the course of my life. And I'm glad to know that Jesus took my sins and buried them and he will not allow anybody else to come and pick them up again. that every time the devil tries to tell you about your past, you need to tell him about his future. Amen. Somebody give the Lord a, a real praise. You've got to remind yourself, you know what? You've got to tell 
Turn to somebody and say, you know who? If you don't know your word, the devil will condemn you with your past. So many people are living a life of guilt and shame because they can't get past their past. Don't look at me with that tone of voice. They cannot get past their past, but you've got to get past your past. And you've got to be able to say, I believe that Jesus is the light of the world and there, and there is no darkness in him. So that means that if he's in me, then there's no darkness in me. Look at your neighbor and say, there is no darkness in me. You're not convincing anybody. Maybe something is going on. And if I, if I have to believe that Jesus not only died on the cross and that he was buried. But here's the kicker, folks. That's how we said in Texas. Here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Here's what separates him from Muhammad. And here's what separates him from Buddha and all of them other jokers. Is that early Sunday morning, Jesus got out of the grave. Amen. He's alive and well. Say that. He's alive and well. Say it with a little bit of attitude. He's alive and well. He's alive and well. He's real. He's alive. He conquered death. He defeated the devil. He stepped out of the grave. And the question is, do you believe that? Not only was he raised from the dead, but he's coming back real soon. How many of you believe he's coming back? Well, how many of you believe he's coming back? But now, if you really believe that he was coming back again, some of you wouldn't be living the way you're living now. Oh, shoot. Somebody start my, somebody start my truck. Be tough. Huh? You wouldn't be living the way you're living now. If you really thought in your heart that he might crack the sky open tonight, you would have lived all of this week all differently than the way you do. I love to pastor Destiny Community Church in Amen. So, so, so that's the first test. What do you really, truly, deep in your heart believe? Because your belief will dictate the second thing. Verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So here's the second question of the test. What do you practice? That's a good test. So the second question of the test is, what do you practice? What do you practice? Now the scripture says that if you say you're saved, and if you say you have fellowship, but you walk in darkness, the Bible says you're a liar. I, I, I didn't put it in there. Somebody a long time ago put it, I, I'm just, don't, don't, don't shoot the mail, man. The Bible says that you're a liar. Look, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him, Jesus. If what? Come on, real loud. If we what? Now he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. If you, if you say you know him and you don't keep his commandments, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. Did you notice that he says the same thing twice? It's all right, folks. It's just a test. Chill out. It's just a test. Verse 4. He who says, I know him, does not keep his commandment, is a liar. The truth is not in him. Verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected or matured in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Wow, uh, this is getting This is getting Are you really in the faith? Are you really born again? Are you really a Christian?
Christian. Because if we are, let's find out why. Why this test? Turn to your neighbor's I love this test. I just love it. I love it. <laughs> now the key in the scripture, the key in the, the key word in the scripture is the word walk. Okay, listen to me. Look, 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 look at me. Listen to me. Because the word walk means what is the ongoing pattern of your life? How are you walking? What is the ongoing pattern of your life? What is it that you do on a regular and continually basis? What is the pattern in your life? That's what the word walk means. What is the pattern in your life? If you have a pattern and continue to do something over and over and over again, with no guilt or conviction, if there's nothing poking you and says, leave that alone, if there's nothing whispering to you, that says, leave that alone, then you better investigate whether or not you're in the faith. Amen. You better find out whether or not you're really in the faith because what I believe and what I know is that when you have a relationship with God and the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, that when you start practicing stuff that you don't have any business practicing, the Holy Ghost will bring some kind of conviction in you. He will not condemn you. God does not condemn. God convicts. And when the Holy Ghost convicts you that something's wrong and you don't listen to the conviction, then you yourself condemn yourself by not taking heed of what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell you. But God does not condemn. God lovingly removes the Holy Ghost wants to warn us and he nudges us and he whispers to us. But when we don't listen, we bring condemnation on ourselves through our disobedience. But it didn't come from God. Well, well, why would God condemn you? God doesn't condemn you. You condemn you. God warns you. Lovingly warns you. God, I wish you'd hear the heart of your pastor this morning. He starts talking to you. The Holy Ghost. He starts saying, are you supposed to be talking to that person? Are you supposed to be having coffee with that person? You know he's married. Are you supposed to be listening to that to be listening to that about other people? Are you supposed to hold on to this unforgiveness? Are you in the faith? This is basic. We want to prophesy and evangelize and those things are good, but, but we gotta get the basics down. We gotta get the Sunday school stuff down. Are you supposed to stand there and listen to gossip? Would you be gossiping if nobody else was around? Would you be looking at that magazine or going to that website if Jesus was sitting right there next to you? I'm just taking the test. Would you hit your wife with Christ standing right next to you? I'm just taking the test. To see if I'm really in the faith. To see if I'm really, really a, a Christian. I'm taking this test. What are you practicing? What's the routine that you've accepted in your life that's unacceptable? Let me be clear on something, please. Because I'm concerned how you're looking at so let me be clear on something if I may. None of us are perfect except the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, they're not even there. But look at me, look at me. Oh, you decide. Folks, none of us are perfect. Please don't get the image or, or don't think that I'm trying to uh, stand up here and try to preach like I'm saying, I'm probably worse than most of you. You are? None of your business. <laughs> None of us are perfect, my friend. Not a single one of us is perfect. God knows we've all got shortcomings. And God knows that we've all missed the mark. But what I'm about, what I'm talking about is what have you accepted that is unacceptable? 
How are you walking? What have you accepted? Because I believe the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will keep talking to you when you're doing things you're not supposed to be doing. Amen. Notice that the, now I better not say that because I noticed that the amens are getting fewer and fewer. <laughs> so I'm going to hurry up and try to finish this as fast as I can. I'm going to the taco truck tonight and so I'm You love the Lord? Yeah. You love the Lord? Yeah. Then give him a prayer. Yeah. Now to you, to you that have aspirations of being a pastor, understand that as a senior pastor or any one of our pastors would have the responsibility, any one of our pastors has the responsibility from God to challenge us on these things any one of our pastors, because they knew that they, 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 I don't want you to think that you can keep living just any kind of way right. and still come to church and be okay. Right. Right. Come on. I don't want you to think that you can live any way you want to live, that it's okay because I go to Destiny Community. So today I'm preaching this so that you cannot stand before God and say, Pastor Charlie never told me. Pastor Lydia never told me. Pastor Ben, none of the pastors there ever told me or ever asked me if I was really in the faith. If I really had a relationship with God. Oh boy, this is good. This is good. This is good. And so Paul raises questions to this church in Corinth because they knew the scriptures, but somehow they had reasoned in their mind that they were able to go past those scriptures and keep doing what they were doing. Now Paul is saying, Paul is saying this, I can't believe you all are calling yourselves the saints of the most high God. That's what he's saying to them. I can't believe you all are calling yourselves the saints of the most high God and that you have a relationship with him and that you're practicing the things that you practice. So Paul writes this, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. <laughs> Examine yourselves to see if you're really in the faith. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith or not. Examine yourself to see if you really have a deep down seated, grounded, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Take the test. Examine yourself. What do you believe? And what do you practice? I don't believe that if you have a relationship with God that he would allow you to keep doing the things that some people are doing. It's one, it's one thing to fight and conquer sin. I understand. And I admire people who fight and work and strive to do that. I admire them. I admire them because they fall down, but they pick themselves up again and they dust themselves off and they go on and strive to do right. I admire those people when they fail or they may stop or they may make a mistake. They get back up and learn from that dust and arms. Okay, I'm going to go see what the rest of my journey is like. I admire those kind of people. Do I have any kind of those people here? Some 
milk from the cow, but they don't want to buy the whole cow. They don't want to make no kind of commitment. But I want the milk. Milk this. Two clean sheets don't make no dirt. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Listen, I don't want you to think that Destiny Community Church, that we are not a church that preaches holiness, that we, we, we preach the holiness of God in Destiny Community Church that will cause you to live a holy life. You've got to fight to live holy, folks. This is a fight, and the devil's trying to get you on the wrong track. But if you're a child of God, you've got to fight. You've got to do battle, and you've got to go to Jesus, and he'll help you win the fight. Oh, yeah.
has been born of God, how many of you here born again? Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, so he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Wow. In other words, you cannot make sin a practice and be comfortable with it. That's right. That's what he said. You cannot make sin a practice and be comfortable with it. How many divorces are you going to go through and put no effort to ever make it a practice? How many times are you going to go to jail and make no effort to make it right? How many times are you going to lose your kids and make no effort to make it right? Are you in the faith? Are you born again? Are you a Christian? How many times are you going to do these things and never make it right? Don't get comfortable in that stuff. I tell you what, I would never divorce my wife no matter what she did. I might consider murder, but divorce, no. I shouldn't be playing around that. Not, not, not nowadays, I shouldn't. Listen, listen. Before you talk divorce, let me just say that they are not Whoever you're trying to divorce, listen, listen to me. They are not beyond the ability of God to change them. Look at me. Look at my wife. Look at our marriage. And let me just say, you haven't been holy on your life. You haven't been holy on your life. I know you're not liking this because nobody's put any money up there.
Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How do you get along with others? Because if you walk in the light, he gives us the ability to fellowship with one another if you walk in the light. Amen. That's it. If we walk in the light. If. If we walk in the light, then God gives us the ability to fellowship with one another. I dare say that if you can't get along with nobody and you don't like nobody, you better investigate whether you're not in the faith or whether you are in the faith. You better examine yourself. If you have trouble with somebody, and I'm not talking about a day, a week, a month. Maybe a month is too long. Maybe a week is too long. But years? Really? Years. Then you're not in the light. And you better examine yourself to see whether or not you're really in the Christian faith. If you're really born again. How does election make, make me realize a lot of people are not in the faith? They quit talking to one another. They quit talking to family members. They quit talking to. <laughs> But if I looked at that <laughs> Now, if I had like 10 more dollars, I could take my wife out. <laughs> I haven't included her in this yet. <laughs> huh? This election has just destroyed relationships. It started to destroy churches. You know why I didn't destroy this one? Because I didn't live it.
Love your pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Don't look like him. You love me a little bit. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They all come from this side. This is the same side. I don't know about this side over here. And some one guy with some funny work boots and got for free. I'm just kidding. You can come and get your money if you want, but if you don't, never mind. <laughs> turn your name all kinds of turn your name so you can learn how to love other people. <laughs> See, I'll tell you why that's important. And I'm, and I'm sure you've heard of the new movement that's going on. But I don't know if you know, but for the past three and a half years, almost four years, there's a new movement that, that, that's going on of people that don't want to go to church. Because they believe that they don't have to go to worship uh, to church. They can worship God at home. And, and yes, we can all we all ought to worship God at home. But the Bible also teaches that you ought to fellowship with others. Why? Why do you? Why should I fellowship with others? Well, because you cannot become what God wants you to become by yourself. Right. See, that, that, that's why this divorce thing is. See, God gave me this destiny red-headed woman. That's the color for her hair. We call it destiny red. Why are you looking at me like that? But the purpose that he gave me this woman was because she used to become my health mate. In other words, there's a place that God has already designated for me, but I cannot get there without my help mate. She has been put by my side to help me get to where I need to be. There's a lot of times I wanted to quit ministry, and she says, you can't do that. There's a lot of times I wanted to go minister, some, preach someplace else, start a church someplace else. And she says, you can't do that. And I said, why not? She said, I can't go with you. And I said, what do you mean you won't go with me? She said, that's not what God called me to do. Amen. She helps me. Amen. Now, there was a time that she, I, I believe she lost her mind. That's my personal belief. Because <laughs> she filed for divorce. I think she was, she's probably on some kind of stuff. I mean, really, look. Come on. She fell for divorce. What's up with that? Now, if we were divorced, this is how serious this is. And I would have married somebody else. I would have never been able to accomplish what God called me to accomplish because that was not the first one that was designated to help me get to where God was. So instead of divorcing, I better learn how to work on my marriage and try to straighten out as much as I can because I don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to disappoint my wife. I want to do what God's called me to do. And I can never get there without this person who will be my wife. Hey! Get that one, you too. 
way to 999 number one.
Scriptures 3.14. I did this for touch. Let me read you that. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Spiritual death. You're spiritually dying. The longer you hold on to that junk and you can't love your brother, you are spiritually dying. And I'm not talking to your brother that's in your family. I'm talking about your Christian brother. Not only in your family, but in your church. You are spiritually dying. And I don't know if that's okay with you. I pray that it's not okay with you. I pray it's not okay. Verse 15 says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Can you put that on 1 John 3, 15? Real quick and see how quick you are. 1 John 3, 14 and 15. I just wanted to save time, but I shouldn't have been late. I should have probably been late. It's worth waiting for. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life. How do we know? Because we what? Love. Come on, live without it because we what? Love. He who does not love his brother abides in spirit. The next one. Whoever, whoever hates his brother is a And you know that no murderer Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself to see if you are born again. Examine yourself to see where you are with what you confess. Question number one, what do, we, what do you believe? Question number, test question number two, what do you practice? Test question number three, how do you get along with others? Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You don't have eternal life living in you if you hate your brother. You say, do you remember? The scripture said, but they say, you say, you do. The scripture says, you don't. So here's the test. You know you're saying because God has given you the capacity to love people that you know are, are unlovable. I want you to take the test every day of your life. Look at it. I want you to ask yourself, what do I really believe? If you have questions about what you believe, you cry out to God and you say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Number two, you ask yourself, what do I practice in life? What have I accepted in life that is unacceptable to God? And I practice it by doing it over and over and over and over and over again, although I know it's not acceptable. What do I practice in life? What is it that you've accepted as normal that you know is wrong? There's not always the big thing. Did you know that even the way you think is wrong? Cast down every evil imagination. Cast it down into them that, that exalts itself above the things of God, about God's way of thinking. God says love. And that thing exalts and says, no, hey, cast it down. Don't play with it. Don't toy with it. Don't let the sun go down on that thought process. Deal with it. Send a text. Send an email. Make a phone call. Do whatever you got to do. Or are you in the faith? Are you born again? You love Jesus. What's your practice in life? And the last question is, how do we get along with other people? If there are people in the church that you don't want to talk to, you don't like you you're okay with that you're okay 
you sit on the opposite side of the building and you're okay with that? Look at your pastor. And you better examine yourself to see if you're really in the thing. To see if you're really born again. To see if you really love Jesus enough to make that right. Because you will not live in that puddle. That's not what Christ died on the cross for. Stop coming to church and talking and shouting and raising your hands. You know you're not loving somebody. You know that. Running around and shouting. But you still haven't talked to that person. You don't even acknowledge them. Don't come to church and throw your hands up and say, Shandai, 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 Shandai. When you know in your heart there's somebody here that you haven't made it right. Well, they started it. Then you finish it. Make it right. Are you in the faith? Finish it the right way. Are you in the faith? Examine yourselves. That's all God is saying. That's all Paul was saying to the church of Corinth. You've been a good church, but now all this stuff has come in. Church of Corinth. Contentions, jealousies, gossips. And he says, church, examine yourself. I'll tell you why. Because if you really believe, if you truly believe, it will be manifested in how you treat other people. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. examine themselves. Am I really a Christian? Because here's what a Christian does. And here's what a Christian doesn't do. I'm not judging you. It's a test for you to take on your own. I have no right to judge. I wouldn't dare judge you. I love you too much to judge you. But folks, every once in a while, when you're in a long drive, a long journey, like a Christian journey, Every once in a while, you got to pull off the freeway, grab a couple of Starbucks, look at the map, and make sure you're still on track. Make sure you haven't missed a turn. Make sure you haven't. And if you're not on track, or you hurry up and finish the coffee, and you get on track before you get on the road again. Say, God, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry I missed a turn. I really am. I'll be more careful, Lord, help me. And get back on track. Amen. That's what I pray. Amen. Amen. So you're going to come to church Sunday? Yes. You're going to come inside me? Yes. Because you've examined yourself. Now you may not come still, you may still not be perfect, but neither is the guy that's preaching. But we're working on it, aren't we? Yes. We're not comfortable with failing and saying it's okay. We're not, we're not comfortable with sitting and saying it's okay. 
Correct? Amen. Because we are born again. And we are in the faith. I love you. God bless you. One more time, give the Lord a praise. A few announcements. And we'll do this. Amen.